independent economist Saul Eslake. Uh, he is the voice when it comes to uh, all things about the economy and interest rates and inflation. As we learned uh, earlier in the uh, in the hour, the, uh, the last hour, I should say, the monthly consumer price index, your CPI indicator, rose 4.9% per in the last 12 months to October 2023, according to the latest data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. What does it all mean in the grand scheme of things as we try to curb inflation? Uh, that's that's the big headlines all the time, and the best person to try and bust all that down is independent economist Saul Eslake, uh, who joins me now. Good morning, Saul. Um, good morning, Bill. Thank you for having me on your program again. Nice to have you back. Uh, all right, is it? Um, what, what's the good news out of this one? The, the headline inflation fell. Uh, that's right. The good news is that headline inflation fell to 4.9%, where it had been in July before higher petrol and electricity prices pushed it up to 5.6% in September. So that's good, although it's still a long way above the Reserve Bank's 2 to 3% target. The not-so-good news, it's, it's not bad news, but it's not as good as we might have hoped for, is that the Reserve Bank's preferred measure of underlying inflation, which strips away volatile things like vegetables and petrol prices, that dropped only 0.1 of a percentage point in October to 5.3%. Uh, that's down from a peak of 72 in December, but it's well above the Reserve Bank's target range. And Michelle Bullock, the governor of the Reserve Bank, who last week made the assertion that Australia's inflation was now largely homegrown, having been initially triggered by global factors like Last year, but she says it's now largely homegrown. That's underscored by the another piece of today's numbers, which shows that whereas the prices of tradable items, that is things that are either imported from overseas or whose prices are directly influenced by global factors, they fell 1.6% in the month of October and were up only 2.5% over the year to October. But the price of non-tradable items, that is things that don't directly compete with imports and aren't so influenced by global factors, that's up 6% from a year earlier. So uh, my summing up of this is there's nothing in today's numbers that suggests the Reserve Bank will be giving any thought to raising rates at next week's meeting, the last for the year. But unless we see some more progress on those measures of inflation that the Reserve Bank is most focused on in November and December, you can't rule out another rate hike at the first meeting in 2024, which will be on the 6th of February. What else is going to shift the dial apart from the rates? What what will have need to happen for her to keep the uh, not have to put the foot on the brakes again? Well, inflation itself is the thing that the Reserve Bank is most focused on and most sensitive to. Uh, the other important indicators that the Reserve Bank is watching are indicators of what's happening in the labour market. Most obviously, the unemployment rate, although the Reserve Bank's also conscious these days that when employers want to cut their wages bill, they have alternatives to sacking a proportion of their workforce, they can reduce the hours which workers work, especially if they have a large part-time contingent. So they'll be looking at measures of hours worked, of underutilisation of their workforce, as the statisticians call it these days. They'll be looking at that. But the main fo- their main focus will be, as it was in the lead up to the November meeting where they hike rates by 25 basis points, are they making satisfactory progress towards their goal of having inflation back within their 2 to 3% target range by the second half of 2025? And if they're not making that sort of progress, then uh, there is a risk that Australia's cash rate will go up again. After all, Australia's inflation rate is, as of October, higher than in almost all the countries you'd reasonably compare ourselves with. So it's, um, uh, as we've just said, the underlying rate of inflation is 5.3% in Australia over the year to October. In the US, it's 4. In Canada, it's 3.4. In the Euro area, it's 4.5. In New Zealand, it's 5.2. The only country you'd legitimately compare Australia with that has a higher underlying inflation rate than Australia is the UK, where it's 5.6. 
seven, but all of those countries have cash rates that are higher than ours. You know, it's five and a quarter in the US, it's five and a quarter in Canada, it's five and a half in New Zealand, and their Reserve Bank met today and kept it at five and a half percent, even in the euro area at four and a half percent. So we've got lower interest rates than countries which have lower inflation than we do. Mm. We asked. We talked about this this morning. At some of the headlines at some of the Labor backbenchers, the federal Labor, they want more elbow and the Treasury to do more to ease cost of living pressures for people. Uh, but is that is that counter to what we're, the, the Reserve Bank is trying to do? And is it just a matter of having to suck it up and, and sit tight? Uh, because we've also had callers in small businesses saying people aren't spending money uh, and they're finding it tough. It's it's a really complex. <laughs> Well, it is Scenario. a situation and that, you know, there's no argument. And Michelle Bullock, in speaking in Hong Kong yesterday, readily acknowledged that uh, people with mortgages and small businesses are feeling the pinch from higher interest rates. And she acknowledged that she's not the most popular person mm. in the country at the moment because she's put interest rates up, as her predecessor had done 12 times. Um, but against that... Spending is still surprisingly strong. I mean, retail sales, we learned earlier this week, were down 0.2 of a percent in October, but all the commentary around that suggests it was because people were holding back in order to spend more at the Black Friday mm. Cyber Monday sales, which anecdotal evidence suggests that they've done. Um, spending is also being held up by the very rapid growth in our population of more than 2.5%. So that's contributing in various ways to inflationary pressures. The government has tried to take some of the heat off cost of living pressures in electricity. And in today's numbers, rents were actually down by 0.2 of a percent, largely because of the increase in Commonwealth rent assistance for low-income renters that took effect on the 20th of September. So most of the effect was felt in October rather than September. If it hadn't been for that, the Stats Bureau calculates that in Instead of falling by 0.2 of a percent, rents would have gone up by 0.7 percent in October. Uh, likewise, the increase in electricity prices that has been in the CPI in the last three months would have been bigger if it wasn't for the effect of the energy relief measures that were announced in the federal budget. So these things help in certain areas. Mm. But against that, if the, if the government were, as some people are urging it to do, throw a whole lot of cash at households with the intention or, uh, of alleviating some of these cost of living pressures, the risk would be that households would go out and spend that, yep. adding to the inflationary pressures in the economy. So it's a fine line that the government has to walk between meeting legitimate demands to help those who are genuinely struggling with cost of living pressures, but not being so generous as to make those cost of living pressures worse. Yeah, great analysis. Thanks very much for your time again, Saul. Uh, Thank you for having me, Bill. It's a pleasure.